And it's great to be back again. <laughs> um, I've had a wonderful interaction here uh, since yesterday morning with so many people, with so many interesting stories to tell, and so many people who have either got Irish connections or who have been to Ireland and who've been deeply enthralled by what's there. Well, that uh, is how I feel every day of the week, and that grew significantly in intensity last summer. Um, so today's talk is a little bit different to yesterday's um, uh, for reasons that will become apparent. So let's get straight to action. So a little bit about Bruna Bonia, the bend of the Boyne. Uh, it's famous because of, mainly because of Newgrange and Nouth, which are two of three very large chambered cairns dated to a little bit before five millennia ago in the case of now 3300 BC and in the case of Newgrange 3100 BC. Now, the, the Bend of the Boyne was afforded uh, World Heritage status by UNESCO in 1993. And that was actually on account of the megalithic art because uh, this small area, which encompasses about five square kilometers, uh, contains uh, a quarter of all of the known megalithic art. Uh, in Western Europe, which is where most of the megalithic uh, sites similar to these are located. And so in the old maps, and we were talking yesterday about the, the lettering convention, you know, the antiquarian uh, archaeologists began labeling things with letters, which is a very dull and boring way to do things. And so over the years, and especially since the designation, Brunebonia has been studied intensely. So 50 years ago or so, uh, just over 50 years ago, if you were there in 1960, there wasn't too much interest apart from the locals. But in the 1960s, the excavations of Newgrange and Nouth began. And so slowly over the next couple of decades, the age of these sites and the true enormity of what was there was revealed. And so, the maps kind of get more complex over time. This is a map I did in 2012, and several features that weren't on the older maps have been added. For instance, you know, these linear um, um, sacred routeways or whatever they might be. Um, there are more, I mean, the, the ponds down on the floodplain of the Boyne and up here are believed to be possibly man-made ritual ponds from some unknown date, but possibly way back in the Neolithic. And so all of the time, our knowledge of what's there has been increasing. In 2010, a significant uh, report was published by the INSTAR group, and that was called the Boyne Valley Landscapes Project. And um, that, using remote sensing techniques, discovered a whole load of stuff hidden in the landscape that hadn't, either hadn't been seen before or hadn't been thought to have been anything of archaeological significance. And so the main project leader on this is an archaeologist uh, attached to University College Dublin called Steve Davis, not the snooker player. And Steve um, tells me that, because I needed to know this for something I was writing, in that small area, so we're, we're talking about this promontory of land around which the Boyne loops, which we discussed yesterday, there are 132 prehistoric monuments in that small area. Now that kind of summarizes Ireland very neatly because Ireland is like a carpet, a whole mosaic of archeology. span You can't walk uh, very far in Ireland without encountering something <laughs> ancient, a ring fort, a standing stone, you know, uh, a portal tomb, a cairn, a mound. And you don't know whether it dates to 50 years ago, 500 years ago, or 5,000 years ago. So anyway, this is one of the fields uh, close to Newgrange. And so quite a number of the fields in the area, so people should maybe understand this. Uh, the World Heritage Site, the majority of the land in that site is privately owned farmland. So the field, the field in which Sheedinbroga or Newgrange is located is state owned. The field in which Nouth is located is state-owned, and the field in which Douth is located is state-owned. Almost everything else is on private farmland. So this is one of the large fields close to Newgrange. 
And as you can see, there's nothing to see here, right? So let's just move along, yeah? <laughs> Except for in the Instar uh, report, uh, which, as I say, revealed blips and small things that you or I, the non-experts, would just sort of gloss over and say, no, that's, that's, there's nothing, there doesn't seem to be anything there. So in this image, your attention is probably drawn to this structure on the right. So this is an embanked henge. Uh, it's labeled site P, which I think is really funny because it looks like a Q. <laughs> and actually on the old maps, it was originally designated site O. And then some archeologists realized you can't label rings with O's because they just look like more rings. But on the left-hand side of this image, there is a blip, let's call it, a little rise in the LiDAR imagery. And here, there's a sort of a linear feature. This is very interesting. Anyway, this feature was the one that was sort of primarily excavated by archaeologists at the time. So a few years ago, as a photographer and researcher of the sites, having spent a long, long time in the Boyne Valley, I realized, because several friends had done so, that I was going to need to get one of these because when you get one of those, everything that's monumental in scale suddenly looks different and you get these terrific views over the landscape. Views like this, for instance. So that is the aforementioned Site P, the embanked henge and the field that we initially discussed, which, which has no obvious archeology span in it. Let's move along. And um, I, I, I realized, of course, as I've known for years that if you take an image of, and this is a very sort of subtle uh, uh, feature. I mean, when you're standing in the middle of it, you don't get the sense of huge banks surrounding you. It's very subtle in the landscape, you know, but well, it's in a plow zone. It's, it, you know, years ago there was plowing activity. You might also note that there's an extra sort of feature on the Eastern end of it, like an, an annex of sorts. Anyway, we, we will come back to site P. And so, um, I, I, I noticed that that linear feature that had been identified in the LiDAR under certain lighting conditions from the air was actually visible in the aerial photography. The wonderful thing about LiDAR, which is a very precise way of imaging the landscape, is afterwards with the software on the computer, you can create artificial lighting and light the features from any direction and any angle, which you cannot do with sunlight because the sun will only follow a certain range of azimuths on its rising and setting. And so just so for comparative purposes, you'll see that this is the inverted image from, from the INSTAR report, site P, the linear feature, and what they label site LP2. So there's site P and there's the linear feature and LP2 is probably just off to the edge here. So this is all really not very interesting actually. The linear feature, what could that be? There are several um, cursus monuments in the area. There are features that have been described as possible ceremonial raised routeways. But this one is very short and it appears to be truncated on the western end by a, a blip, a sort of a, you, you could possibly call that a mound, you know. So anyway, uh, in early July last year, in this part of the world, archaeologists started to make very significant discoveries. Sorry. Thanks to the fact that the drought, the lack of rainfall, had sort of created this um, parched landscape from which features that had previously not been seen were emerging. And actually, if you look at the date, this is significant. If you look at the date on those articles, they were published on the 9th of July, 2018, and that's significant to this story. Because around that time, I had just returned from, ironically, I brought my family to the south of Spain, to Costa del Sol on a holiday, uh, during the most intense heat wave since 1976. <laughs> we, we, didn't, we didn't have left the country because it was so warm and so hot. Now, what had happened in the Boyne Valley was that it hadn't rained, as far as I'm aware, from memory. I'm pretty sure there was no rain from Bialtana at the Fire Festival at Ishnach, which was a beautiful weekend on the 5th of May last year. There was no rain in the Boyne Valley till at least the middle of July. 
So this is 9th of July, the day after I returned from holidays. Uh, so there was an archaeological dig taking place very close to Newgrange. So see the roadway here? My, my drone is above the roadway, and this is the roadway that runs in front of Newgrange. So Newgrange is literally r right at the bottom of this image here. And what I wanted to do briefly was to, was to get an image of the, the trench, the archaeological dig, with Newgrange in the background. So I flew out in this direction from Newgrange. Um, and here's again this field that we discussed at the beginning, nothing to see here. So we're going we're to keep moving on. And so I flew down and turned the drone around and looked back with the trench and with Newgrange in the background. I thought, yeah, this is great. This is exactly what I'm looking for. Now, I didn't realize it at the time, but, and this is very unusual, it was so dry that crop marks were visible in grass, which is very unusual. I mean, they're much more easily visible in crops, standing crops, like the predominant tillage crops in Ireland would be wheat, barley, and oats, but mainly wheat and barley. Now, the reason I flew that evening was because I wanted to get this picture. And I didn't realize this until a month or so afterwards. I don't know if you can see this. Can you see archaeology in that picture coming through the grass? That is what has now been confirmed to be a late Neolithic cursus, which looks like that in the, um, I think that's magnetic radiometry. Um, uh, I think the lady who revealed this image a few years ago was Joanna Lee, I think is her name. And on the basis of this, the archaeologist said, oh, we'd love to put a trench in there and see. Because they didn't know whether it was an Neolithic cursus or a 19th, 18th or 19th century garden feature. Because in 1699, Charles Campbell had come along after the Battle of the Boyne, a Scottish Protestant, and had acquired the land in the area and had built Newgrange House, which, by the way, was just located uh, on the western end of this. Now, that image is turned, so the east is to the, is to the, to the bottom of this image and the west is to the top. So, so up here somewhere, uh, Campbell built uh, New, Newgrange House. And so, based on the instar, what they had seen in the LIDAR here in this field, which is another field down from the excavation that took place last year, they had found this, uh, and they had done the magnetic radiometry, which is carried out by Kevin Barton. And they revealed what they thought at the time was a passage tomb in the center of uh, what appeared to be a henge. And so, I got very excited by that. This was, you know, the INSTAR report was a very comprehensive report of about 200 pages. And so I produced a blog post about it saying how they'd found the first passage tomb in the Boyne Valley in decades. And this gathered significant interest in the media. Uh, there was quite a, a hoo-ha about it because they thought this was uh, quite interesting. Now, we will come back to this. But on the same evening, on the 9th of July, I, I only flew very briefly and so, see in this image here, this is a mound, believed to be a passage tomb, Mount A, delightful names. This is the one we identified yesterday as Dagda's Mound, Mound B, down on the floodplain. Site A1 is another sort of flattish mound. There are actually four previously unknown archaeological features visible in that photograph. Uh, sorry, five. Four, sorry, four. But this one had been identified years before. This is probably the remains of an ancient roadway. But there are four more in here, including down here on the floodplain, two, which I didn't fly down to have a look at because I didn't see them on the screen, uh, two henge monuments down near to the Boyne, which had previously been undiscovered. This one is surrounded by a henge site, site A. And again, this henge appears to have an annex on the east side of it. So that's significant. And then the next day, discovery day. So Steve Davis had seen my image of the excavation and he said to me, you know, Anthony, you should fly down and have a look at site P because site P is bound to look very different to normal. And you're probably going to see features in site P that we haven't seen before. So the next day at work, all day long, and I can't explain it, I had this tremendous urge to go back out flying. It was like 
I need to go back out. I knew there was something that I needed to do. I hadn't flown enough the previous day. And spurred on by Steve, who suggested that I should do, I went back out the next evening, Tuesday the 10th of July, and he was right about Site P. Site P was dramatically different to how I'd ever seen it before. So very briefly, and I'm not an archeologist, but I, I, I'm just repeating what the archeologists have said about this. You know, is the, there are positive and negative crop marks, the, the, the bright and the dark. The bright represents areas where there are probably stones beneath the surface. So the grass isn't getting, it's getting even less moisture than the grass, the, the ordinary grass. And the darker are believed to be sort of uh, pits, trenches, anything that's been dug out and gradually filled in with organic material over time. So you can see that there's probably an amount of stone in the, embank in the embankment around Site P. The total width of this, by the way, is, is at least 150 metres. It's, it's, it's around 500 feet in diameter, this thing. And then on the inner side of it, you can see the darker area where the bank is. And then what appears to be an opening on this side and perhaps an opening on the back side. And even what are described as, and I don't exactly understand what these are, uh, construction compartments is how they're described by the archaeologists. So when you compare the ordinary imagery with the drought imagery, you see such a massive difference. You know, the landscape of Ireland, even in the middle of summer, is so verdant and so green because we get regular rainfall. And in the summer, at this time of year, May, June, this is when we get peak grass growth, you know, which is great. The farmers love it because the, all of the dairy cattle are out munching grass and there's lots of silage being harvested to see the cattle through the winter and everybody's happy. In 2018, that was not the case. There ended up being quite a dire shortage of uh, fodder to feed the cattle with. And you can see in this image how verdant and how green everything is along the riverbank, where the moisture is obviously being soaked into the soil from the river, and yet everything else is so uh, parched looking. So that uh, was flight one of the evening of Tuesday the 10th of July. So at 8.28 p.m. I was engaging in flight one around site P. You may see something in the top right hand side of that image. I did not see that at the time at 8.28 p.m. So I'm flying a drone that basically, uh, if any of you have flown a drone, uh, what a lot of people do is they attach a, a mobile phone or a tablet uh, where you're getting a, basically a live feed from the camera on the drone. And so I was using my phone, which is only this size. And so in the low sun, I may perhaps not seeing the sort of detail that somebody might have seen if they were using a larger tablet. So I did not see this feature in the top right at that time. I then turned back towards the east, looking back at some of the other features. Now, again, there are several likely previously undiscovered, unrevealed monuments in this. This one to the lower left is interesting because it's quite circular. And again, because it's a, a bright uh, mark, it would suggest, and it's only a suggestion, and of course we can't confirm this until at some point more investigation is done, that is likely to be a destroyed or denuded cairn. There's likely to be stone under there. And because it's circular, you imagine that maybe it's a destroyed mound, you know? And then I even flew up to Sheed and Brogue, our new grange itself, and you can probably see that in the 1980s, the great Bronze Age pit circle, which is on the southeastern side of Newgrange, the excavated pits became visible in, in the grass. And not only that, you can probably see the, the, where, where the drainage pipes were put in during the, the excavations, probably put in in the 1970s, actually became visible in the, in the grass. 8.44 p.m. What happens when you're flying the drone? <laughs> it starts going beep, beep, beep. So uh, now that's 35%. At 30%, the DJI Phantom 3 Advanced, which is the drone that I own, starts to beep at you. The sensible way to fly a drone is you constantly keep an eye on the battery level. Because if the battery runs down, the thing falls out of the sky, smashes to the ground, and it's game over. So at 40%, you're really keeping it close enough that you can get it back to you quickly and easily. And at 30%, you have to land it. Some people fly it down to 20 and 15%. I don't do anything reckless like that. So this is what I see on the screen. 
This is actually a screenshot taken on the night. Because I just realized, just in case there was some sort of a failure, I should get some record of what, what was going on that night. Anyway, luckily, I keep some spares. <laughs> and I, I had seen these wonderful pictures of Site P, and something said to me, no, you need to go back down there again and do more. So I did. Flight two. Uh, I sent the drone up again and immediately sent it back down towards Site P. But on my way down to Site P, I saw this. 8.47 p.m., Tuesday the 10th of July 2018, is a moment I will never forget. I saw this circular thing in the field west of Site P, the one that we keep saying is of absolutely no archaeological interest. And I let out an exclamation. <laughs> now that's as best I can recollect what I said. <laughs> it may have been something else. Um, but my distinct memory is seeing it, snapping the, so the, the shutter buttons on the side of the controller. So I'm immediately clicking as I'm flying towards it. And I shout, what the hell is that? My friend, Ken Williams, who's also a photographer, had arrived as I was flying on my first flight. And he said, oh, you're flying, I'll, I'll take my drone out and I'll fly. So he was in the air at this stage. And when I said, what the hell is that? He came rushing over to me. And so I'll show you the sequence of images. This is the sequence of images as they are, were extracted from the card on, on the drone. So this is discovery image. This is the first time I actually saw it. And as we saw on the first flight, it was actually in some of the images, but I hadn't seen it. And you can see in this progression of the first three images, I'm getting closer to it. I'm snapping happily away as I'm getting closer to it. On the fourth image, what's happened there is Ken has come right up beside me to look at my screen. And because the two controllers are radio transmitters, they caused interference with each other. His screen went blank and my screen went blank. And he couldn't see anything. And so he had to move away and he moved away. And he said, what are you seeing? And I said, there's a giant ring in the field west of Site P. So he separated a little bit, but I still couldn't see anything. I said, you need to go further away. And so he moved further away. And when he did, I started to see an image. What had happened was that the drone had spun 180 degrees and was now facing the opposite direction. And that's what that image is about. It took me a moment to regain control of the craft. And then you can see a further progression where I'm getting closer and closer to it, you know? And within moments of that happening, Ken is flying his drone down and he's saying, wow, you know, he, he, he's, he's like me, can't believe what he's seeing on the screen. So well, in the very first instant, and this only lasted a fraction of a moment, a, a second or two, when I saw this, I thought, somebody has been driving a tractor around in a circle in this field and has been revving up the wheels to try and leave these rut marks, you know, at regular intervals. But as I flew closer to it, I realized, no, this is a standing crop. There's no way this is tractor, tractor tire marks. And as I flew around it, it became obvious to me, a, f a few things were very uh, immediately apparent. One, this is something that is not on any of the archeological maps. This is a new discovery. Two, this is bloody massive. I don't know, there's nothing, you see, the difficulty is there isn't a huge amount that shows you the scale, but the best thing that shows you the scale are the tram lines. So these double lines, they're the width of a tractor. So you can imagine a tractor in there is going to be dwarfed by this thing. It's truly enormous, you know. And at this point, within moments of having initially seen it, seen it and seen this mysterious box on the end of it, I'm seeing these double rings of dots around it which I immediately assume are some sort of post holes. And you can see how close it is to the river, you know. And so we are, for the next 15 or 20 minutes, flying around, taking pictures of the landscape, literally shaking with excitement and giggling, laughing and ooing and aahing, like two children who've found a lottery ticket, scratched it, won a 10 grand, gone to an ice cream shop and bought all the ice cream they could ever eat. You know? That's, that's what it was like. It was, Ken is very, very well researched on the archeology span and knows more about it than I do. And we knew, both knew, 
within moments of this discovery that this was likely to be a henge, and therefore likely to be an extremely significant discovery. So one of the features that showed up was what has become described by the National Monument Service as the hook enclosure. We don't actually know what this is. I mean, this could be the remnant of a, an, a, a, an early medieval ring fort, for all we know. And this gives you this, the proximity to uh, Sheed and Brogue, our new Grange. It's approximately 750 metres from New Grange to the centre of the Henge. It's literally, you know, well, not literally a stone's throw, but not too much further away. And then site P in the background. So they're actually quite similar in dimensions, but not just in dimensions but in design as well, because you might have noticed that what we call Drone Henge has this extra crescent-shaped annex on the eastern side of it, as does Site P and as does Site A, which we showed in one of the earlier slides. So one of the first things that we did when we landed was he called an archaeologist friend of his, and I called an archaeologist friend of mine, who was Steve Davis, and Steve answered his, hello, I said, uh, Steve, um, are you online? Can you, can you receive pictures? He said, yeah, I'm going to send you something on, on Facebook Messenger. We've made a fairly significant discovery here in the Boyne Valley. And he says, oh, okay, send it on. So I sent him on a couple of screen grabs, you know. And he comes back on the phone a couple of minutes later. And he, he's basically saying, yeah, yeah that's, that's truly magnificent. That's extraordinary. And as... Uh, the leading light in the Instar project, I think he, he, he was probably astonished, and maybe putting words into his mouth, but he was probably astonished that there was something like this there, where they had only seen this raised linear feature. And Ken's archaeologist friend was likewise saying, wow, this is an incredible discovery. So when, when I got home, uh, well, we, we, after we finished the flight, we both decided we would go to my house, which was close by, uh, to look at the images on the big screen and then to talk further about the discovery and what we were going to do about it. And I, I, I emailed Geraldine Stout, who was, do, who was doing the dig. So her dig is visible in this picture too, in this field here. This is all on Newgrange Farm, which again is privately owned. There's the farmhouse there. And all of this land is owned by Newgrange Farm. And so I, I, I emailed, I think I rang her actually. Geraldine, are you on email? Can you give me an email address that you can access right now? This is half 10 at night. And she said, yeah. I said, I found a henge. She goes, yeah, go on. <laughs> Geraldine has studied the embanked in henges of the Boyne region, has written papers about them. And so her reply, which came just a few moments later, contained the longest version of the word wow that I've ever encountered. And it was all in capitals. It was www.www.www, exclamation mark, lines of exclamation marks. She so was tremendously excited, as of course we were. Um, and so uh, the field itself is very interesting because this is not the only thing. Like drone henge has become famous, okay, worldwide, but it's not the only thing that's there. To its west is uh, uh, what we initially thought might have been a discovery, but then we realised, no, no, that's actually site LP2 from um, from the Instar report. But I did. I don't think what probably wasn't massively obvious from Instar was just the regularity of the segmented ditch feature around it. And this image doesn't perhaps show it, I think, oh, I have another image here. So, you know, in some of the images, it's much more obvious that there is a slight brightening of the circular area around the central feature, you know. Um, but the National Monument Service have dubbed this the Univalet Henge is what they call it. I don't know, make your own mind up which you prefer, LP2 or Univalet Henge. And so this is a comparative image where I've rotated my aerial image to match what was seen in the gradiometry. And you can see that there is a, a hint here of segment, segmentation of the ditch features, but they're much more obvious in the aerial photography. So what's the difference? Well, I don't know how much gradiometry costs, but I imagine something like 10 grand to get a field surveyed. Drone costs a few hundred quid, so you know the drought was starting to reveal features that weren't even seen with these expensive geophysical techniques. So this is a National Monument Service image of LP2 in which the, 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 there's, you can see that there's a ring around that central feature. Now, 
this is why the earlier blog post about the passage tomb is significant, because the drought imagery reveals that this is much less likely to be a passage tomb and more likely to have been some sort of a timber structure uh, with terminals, as is defined here in the uh, National Monuments Report. And there's even evidence uh, of a, a, bright, a brightening outside of the segmented ditch that might represent uh, an outer bank. Of course, when you dig out ditch features, this, the soil has to go somewhere. So you have to ask, where does it go? And we have a three in a row, fantastically. LP2, Dronehenge, and Site P. Um, throwing in some comparisons, Thornborough. I, I'm thinking about or Orion's belt configuration here. I know Thornborough are connected by avenues. And so this is quite different because you got, you've actually three distinct types of monument, even though they're similar in scale. You've an embanked henge, you have one with a double ditch and posts around it, and you've one with a single ditch feature around it. So they're actually quite different in design. Pretty circles in Somerset. Uh, I think there, there were originally four, weren't there? Somebody here will know I'm not too well read. I think there was some damage to one in recent years. But look at all this stuff going on here. So we're told that the dark area running diagonally through this image is a paleo channel. Um, so the old river channel, or possibly a channel where glacial meltwater was rushing down across the landscape in, in far distant prehistoric times. And then all this mottling, this mottled feature here, which can be apparently is one of two things. And you know, the usual thing is you ask two archaeologists for an opinion on something and you'll get three opinions. <laughs> one archaeologist says these are likely to be fossilized um, vegetation marks that from vegetation that grew along the Paleo Channel. Another archaeologist says, no, they might be pits. And if they're pits, they may be an, in, an indication of domestic activity, which is very interesting because in all of the studies over the years of Brunibonia, we have never found the mass habitations of the builders. Where did they live when they were here? And so apart from sp sporadic examples, isolated example at Nauth, for instance, an, an early Neolithic house foundation was found at Nauth, there's nothing to indicate where a large body of people might have lived. And of course, a large body of people were definitely involved in the construction of these things. In the northeast of the field, this was a designated monument, had been seen in a crop mark in 1995 and had been designated a ring ditch. Now, this is no ring ditch. Archaeologists in the room might be able to identify this. This is uh, a, a, a timber circle, uh, something that the archaeologists refer to as a four poster, because there are four large post holes in a sort of a rectangular shape in the center of it. And what makes this obvious, uh, or not uh, obvious, what makes this different is that it's got two, and they're not concentric because the outer one sort of fattens to the north and south. They're not exactly concentric, but it's got two circles of post holes. It has, uh, they're not, maybe a little bit subtle. Well, we'll see another image here in a moment. Uh, two sort of um, lines of pits or post holes running away from it, and then an outer bank. And there it is in the top right. And these things, you know, two very wide arcs of what appear to be regularly interspersed uh, pits or post holes. A super henge, perhaps. Very exciting stuff. So when we got back and we were celebrating and totally exhilarated about discovering Drone Henge, we realized that there was a whole load of other stuff there as well. What makes this one exciting, here is a National Monument Service image of it is that if this is part of a bigger structure, it's truly enormous, this thing. The National Monuments imagery was taken with a digital camera by a photographer who was leaning out the window of a helicopter. So he had higher resolution than we had. Our, my drone has a 12 megapixel image. I think his camera had something like a 36 megapixel image. You may be able to see there's actually a double arc here. This inner arc is a double arc. There's two rows of pits, and between them a brighter area, which m might suggest a bank. There is an outer bank, but there are also, uh, there's also a fourth, or at least what look like additions, or what have been described as petals added. So this is truly tremendous. Now, we didn't realize this at the time, but we'll get back to this. National monuments found further parts of it in their imagery, and they call it the Great Palisade. 
and they found that it's visible in parts of this field and even in parts of this field. Now, if it's a complete ring, and it would be quite oval shaped, not circular, this thing would be almost a kilometre wide. It's certainly 900 metres in diameter. A truly enormous structure. And then I went back to the images that I was talking about earlier. And there it is, look. It's clearly visible in this image, but at the time I took this image, I didn't... You have to remember that field boundaries in Ireland change, and they've changed dramatically, especially since the time of the famine. At the time before the famine, f f holdings were very small in Ireland. You regularly see lines across fields that just simply are the, the old markings of previous field boundaries. So I may have ignored this or, or ruled it out as an archaeological feature, but it is actually what they believe is a great palisade. And is there something else here? I couldn't see it at the time, revealed in more detail by national monuments. Is this uh, oblong, uh, what's been described as a Frankfurter-shaped um, uh, monument that has been described in the national monuments literature as pos a possible mortuary enclosure. And here's the two hinges down along the Boyne that I missed. Ken Williams found these, I think, the next day. Uh, the National Monument's first helicopter flight was on Friday. So ours was Tuesday the 10th, uh, 11th. Theirs was Friday the 13th. <laughs> That's an interesting date. Um, but, but this one had been supposed in, I think, LiDAR imagery. And it's got Mount B1 sort of just slightly off center in it. This one had never, there was no indication of this one at all. <laughs> so after we uh, went back to my house, um, there was a discussion that needed to take place, which was, what are we going to do with all this? Now, I'm a journalist. And one of the mantras that we work by in the newspaper industry is if you have a story, especially a big one, don't sit on it. Why? Because it will blow up in your face. If you sit on it, the next day you'll see it in a rival's paper on the front page. <laughs> and so we had a chat. The proper way to do things is to report these things to the National Monument Service and to allow them to decide. But there is an issue at Brunabonia where almost every day of the week people are flying drones. So we thought, after a few minutes of chat about it, we said, there's only one thing we can do here, which is to release the images on social media. And a, a short description by me uh, describing how I was shaking with excitement. I mean, even at this stage at 11 o'clock at night, I'm actually shaking. I'm, I just can't take this in. It's just such an incredible moment. And that post goes immediately viral. I go to bed, don't get much sleep. And the next day, at half seven in the morning, the phone starts ringing. It's the local radio station. We saw your post on social media. Can we use one of your images? We want to just um, share this with our listeners. And I said, yeah. And basically, for the next three weeks of my life, I was working full time and dealing with the media for all the rest of the time. I barely had time to eat and sleep. I, I was literally on the phone, answering emails on Skype, 24 seven, even sometimes at work, taking phone calls from the media. There was worldwide interest in this. I didn't expect that. I knew it was significant. I think there are two things about it. The first thing is that it was so big. And the one thing that comes over time and time again by people when you're talking to them about it is, how has something so big never been seen before, so close to Newgrange, in a UNESCO World Heritage Site, where hundreds of archaeologists have been studying for years and years and years. And the, and the answer to that's quite simple. It has no surface expression. They are features that are several feet beneath the soil that became visible on the top of a four-foot crop of wheat because they, this particular crop, the ones growing out of the archaeology, have access to a little bit more trace moisture than the, the ones growing out of the surrounding field. And so there's a very slight contrast in the health and color of the crop. But from the air, it becomes quite dramatic. The farmer told me he had walked down the tram lines and he couldn't see any hint of it on the ground. And I wasn't, really wasn't surprised by that because it's probably very, very subtle on the ground. So it went all around the world, BBC, and then the American networks got it. And by Friday, by the day of the National Monuments helicopter, I wanted to go out and photograph them doing their survey. I hadn't got the time. I spent the whole day on Friday 
um, dealing with the media. Der Spiegel, they, they were one of the, you know, the, the, the media started calling it Drone Henge. Uh, I don't get a say in what it's called. The archeologists were suggesting it might be called Site P1. <laughs> I much prefer Drone Henge. <laughs> So it was literally a mind-blowing few weeks because the Stout dig um, eventually, rec um, the, the dates came back from that to say it was late Neolithic. And at nearby Douth Hall, a Georgian house that had been built in the late 18th century was found to have been built on top of a cluster of passage tombs. So these, all these revelations were coming together and it made a fantastic week. La Repubblica in Italy and oh yeah, well sure look, you get the picture. That was lovely, that was nice. That was a, a tweet by the Irish Heritage Min Minister uh, c congratulating us on the discovery. So you can imagine this is an extremely proud moment. The other thing too is, I hope I don't sound um, egotistical or anything, but it was a lovely, lovely reward for 20 years of passionate, dedicated research, which I had done in my own spare time and I had written my books as a hobby. I, I, I was working full time. I was doing all this as a, as a sideline. It was a lovely, lovely way, almost like the two of the Danon were coming back to say, thank you for bringing attention to all these things that have been sort of hidden from view for so long, you know? Now, ironically, within a couple of weeks, we got rainfall, the crop ripened out and almost disappeared again, and then it was harvested. And we thought that would be the last of it, maybe we would never see it again in our lifetime. Shortly after that, I got a phone call from Channel 4. Would I go on telly with Tony Robinson? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> one of my heroes. I mean, I, I, I loved Blackadder when I was a kid. Uh, Baldrick was a hero, cunning plan and all that. And of course, Time Team was a huge favorite in our house. So that was a huge honor. I met him in, um, in um, Fulham Palace in London for a day of filming. The, the, the program was called Hidden Britain by Drone, but they were doing a drought special. And Robinson says in the program, we couldn't leave Ireland out because of the significance of the discoveries made there. In fact, what he said was that we had made one of the most important discoveries in decades, which is brilliant. And uh, a, a really lovely day in the company of uh, a wonderful man. And then National Geographic rang and said, can we come and do a program about your discovery that was aired on Irish TV and probably on British TV last week. Um, it was filmed in August, but it was only aired uh, in America at Christmas time. And there's Ken in his element out in the middle of the field. This is the field after it had been harvested, but the filming was done in the field. And then very recently, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, there was a, an RTE Weather Live event on, on national TV in Ireland. So here's a significant question. How many henges are in this image, okay? There's one, that's LP2. Number two is Drone Henge. Number three is Site P, the aforementioned Site O, which looks like a Q. Site, uh, number four is Site A. Number five is one of the Riverside Henges, the new one dis first discovered by Ken, and then later revealed in the National Monuments imagery. And then six, which is Site B1. But there's another one there. Now, we didn't discover that. National Monuments pieced that together, and they call it the Hidden Henge, because it's not nearly as visible as the other features, uh, and to a much lesser extent. Now, I'm told by Tom Condit, who was the main, uh, he's the National Monuments um, guy who, who was in the helicopter directing the pilot where to fly, and the photographer. His instruction to the photographer was, he said, I want you to think of your camera as a machine gun. Keep your finger on the shutter. And apparently there are thousands of images as a result, which is great because it's a great record and it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. We may not get a drought like this again. The last such a drought in Ireland was in 1976. And that's funny because we had the worst snow in March with the beast from the east since 1984, I think and then the worst drought since 1976. It was a weird year for weather. Are there more? So another one I did, possible, and you can see it's quite obvious here in the LIDAR site, LP1, <coughs> uh, a possible mound with a possible uh, ring structure around it. 
Is this another one here? Who knows? When you look at this image and you see this linear feature, you, you just, there's nothing there that suggests drone hinges there. Nothing. Except for that little clump of earth, which may correspond with uh, a, a sort of a brightening here, which is assumed to be earth that might have been scooped up to support the huge posts that were on that end of it. I must move on a little bit. Henge number eight, which is out of view of that cluster because it's way over on the eastern end of Brunabonia, is site Q, which is the Douth Henge, which is actually the biggest henge in the Boyne Valley and the second biggest in Ireland. I have a claim to fame there too because myself and Richard Moore in the year 2000 became the first to witness a, a solstice alignment that had been suggested in a 1985 paper by Ronald Hicks. So what did Drone Henge look like? I can't answer that, and there's lots of speculation about what, what hinges were for and what they, were, uh, what they might have looked like. The reason it's unique is the double segmented fe ditch features. We don't, there's nothing else to compare this with. So we're, in, we're on sort of virgin ground here, uh, and the archeologists, of course, are very excited, but at the same time, sort of scratching their heads going, not sure what exactly is going on here. You might see also that the outer ring is more faded. The inner uh, segmented ditch is much more visible. So a friend of mine, a Turkish 3D artist, Kerem Gogus, attempted to create something of a representation of what it might have been looked like. Now, We've discussed this, and I think the scale is a little bit out here. Those posts should be smaller than they are. You know, the, the size of the individual here, which he put in for scale, is, is, is too big for the scale of it. But it gives you an idea of what it might have looked like uh, in, in all, and perhaps in the construction phase when they were building it. The reason they think that the outer rings of dots were post holes is because they have a sort of a ramp feature on them. And so if you're putting a post into a ground, you need, it, you, you need to slide it in and then place it up apparently, upright. This is the south, uh, the east southeastern um, uh, entranceway, which they believe is the entrance. And we'll talk about that very briefly. So Kerem had try, tried or attempted to sort of give us some idea of what it might have looked like, but we're, we're, not, we're not sure. We're, 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 we're on conjectural territory here. What was it used for? Well, there might have been an astronomical function. So in the, in the early days, after the discovery, I tried to investigate the possible alignment of it, assuming that the entrance was this, the box feature. And I found that the azimuth suggested that it would point to the sunset at the time of the year approaching Bialtana uh, through the summer period and back again into Lunasa. Now, that's been disputed by the archeologists who suggest we should actually be looking in the opposite direction. And if we're looking in the opposite direction, interestingly, we're looking at sunrise at Samhain and Imbolc, which bracket the winter solstice, which is the major festival associated with Newgrange, where it has the winter solstice alignment. The summer one would make sense for an agricultural agrarian community. So Ronald Hicks suggests that a lot of the henges might have been ANAC sites. That's O-E-N-A-C-H, that's an Irish word. Gathering sites for festivities associated with particular times of the year, possibly the harvest, for instance. And also um, where there might have been trade and fairs and even activities, you know, sporting activities, etc., etc. They're also commemorative sites, commemorating somebody who has died. And so uh, Hicks has done a lot of research on Enoch sites. A sports arena, that's an interesting idea. So in this uh, colorized image, uh, Tomás McCormick colored one of the images. I, I mean, can we imagine, for instance, that the outer rings of post holes are actually supporting tiered seating? And the embanked versions of these hinges, when you sit up on the bank, you get the distinct impression of an amphitheater of an open air sort of, you know, wide space where a large gathering of people could have taken place. And that shouldn't at all surprise us. The contrast with the passage tombs, Newgrange, the contrast is at Newgrange, huge monument, tiny chamber, only fitting comfortably 10 or 12 people. Obviously not designed for huge uh, gatherings, ceremonial gatherings. Henges, on the other hand, these huge enclosures clearly designed for something uh, much more perhaps inclusive. What does the mythology say? Well, this is interesting. In Tuchmark Etain, which is a story connected with Newgrange, the wooing of Etain, I think there's a little clue here that might offer us some glimpse as to what they were for. Dagda, who I was talking about yesterday, the chief of the two Adidan and the sun god, 
who has encouraged his son Ingus Og to go to Siedenbroga at Samhain to take possession of it from Elkmar. So the, I was discussing yesterday how there's a variance in the tales. Some tales say Dogda built it and, and was its first owner, and other tales say Elkmar was its first owner. Well, Dogda suggests to Ingus, you go and challenge Elkmar. Elkmar will be at Knuckshead in Broga with no weapon but a fork of white hazel in his hand, which is a divining implement, by the way, and a symbol of kingship in ancient Ireland. He will be wearing a cloth with a gold brooch on it, and he will be watching the three fifties of youths at play in the playing field. Wow, I thought, that's very interesting. Clearly, we're designed, I think, we're supposed to see Elkmar on the top of Newgrange, watching out over the large spaces in front of him. Now, this is a henge from Pomelta in Germany, where now it's similar but dissimilar. I mean, you can see there are sort of segmented ditch features. <clears throat> At Pomelta, they found in the ditches that there were, there were bones of humans that had been murdered, and they suggested the possibility that some human sacrifice took place there. I would hate to be able to hop in a time machine and go back to Brunabonia to the late Neolithic and find that that was the case here. I hope it was something a little bit more fun and less um, dangerous, shall we say. And so just to finish, and this is something I'm very grateful to Tom Condit for pointing this out. He gave a lecture on Wednesday night in at Nouth about the discoveries. <coughs> and he pointed this out, and it's a really interesting point that I want to just further draw a little bit of a conclusion from. When you're at the Henges, down on the floodplain, looking up at Newgrange. Newgrange is the highest thing in the valley. It's up on top of the ridge, and it's as if it's elevated, and I've said this in my own writing, they build passage tombs on hills and mountains in Ireland, almost as if they're trying to detach from the sublunary uh, terrestrial world and ascend to higher realms, to heavenly realms. But look at Elkmar's view from Newgrange. And this is a national monuments image tracing out all of the new features, or, well, some of them we knew were there, but enhanced. And there's such a tremendous view out over the landscape. And what you can not see here is there are, in fact, there's a ridge, there's a terrace here, and then there's a lower terrace. There's like a stepped landscape. And what I couldn't help but doing when I saw this was doing this, suggesting that the lower terrace where the hinges are was the space for the living. The spaces where, and I have no doubt that people came here from across the water, perhaps from Britain, perhaps from France, to be involved in these monumental constructions, to be involved in whatever festivities took place there. These, these timber hinges are transient monuments. They're not permanent structures like the embanked hinges. They're transient features. The wood rots away, eventually they disappear with time. Hence the reason we didn't know it was there. A living space, a space of commemoration, a space where you give thanks for the harvest, a space where you're looking into the winter and praying that the sun will return back again. A space for the dead behind the great palisade because these features are assumed to be associated with mortuary practices. One of the suggestions about four posters is they, they, they supported an elevated platform upon which the bodies of the deceased were placed in order for excarnation or defleshing to take place, as happens, for instance, in the Native American tradition and this mortuary enclosure. So, is the great palisade designed to demarcate these zones? If you're lower in the sublunary realm, you're okay, because you're still bloody alive. You might be getting your ass kicked in an early Irish game of hurling or something, but you're still alive, you're doing all right. And all the time, you're looking up to the highest point on the ridge fixed amongst the stars, and perhaps that is the zone for the ever living the Tua de Danon, the ancestors who have gone before, whose remains have been retrieved from the mortuary monuments, placed into the chambers, and at solstice, maybe the sunbeam is drawing the spirits of the dead out through the roof box into an other world. And remember that the mythology of the Dedanon says they are able to use the she, the monuments, to migrate between this world and that world. And so you are 
on the floodplain looking up at this and it's a reminder of your final and ultimate destiny but there are steps to be taken on that journey and so much of this before last july was not known it's a remarkable new insight into the history of Brunabonia, one that will be studied for generations to come. And it's such a matter of such great pride that uh, I am so closely involved in the discovery. Little postscript. Remember I said we thought we'd never see it again? March this year, it becomes visible again in, in a crop of spring barley. So some of you will know Pete Glastonbury Pete Glastonbury had said to me, you know that that could become visible again in spring crops. Well, he was bloody right. He knows his stuff. And so just for a short time, and I don't know why, and I will talk to people, I'm writing a book about it at the moment. I will talk to people who are experts in agriculture who can say, what are the processes that, that led it to become visible this time? I assume there is still a moisture deficit. We haven't had the wettest winter ever. You know, it's been a dry winter in Ireland. So that soil moisture deficit that was there after the drought is perhaps still there. And so Dronehenge became visible again, as did the four poster in quite interesting detail, as did site LP2. All in March and April of this year, the crop has ripened out since and the features have vanished. Will we see it again? Who knows? It could become visible this summer if there's a drought. Maybe it might become visible again next spring. We might not see it for another 30, 40, 50 years. It's a once in a lifetime thing, which is recorded in my blog posts about it. If you want to follow up on uh, Dronehenge and anything else that I've spoken about this weekend, uh, Mythical Ireland is the key, mythicalireland.com and on Facebook, uh, Instagram, YouTube especially, uh, it's Mythical Ireland. And my books, I have a couple of them for sale here. I would, to be delighted to offload some of them into your hands and just to to say that in october my publisher will be publishing the book about drone henge uh, and uh, today's talk is sort of a precursor uh, to what will be in that and hopefully a lot more detail besides i will leave you with the final image i took on that fateful evening it was the snapshot as i came in to land the drone and there's ken flying his drone and I'm, I've been uh, approached by a local guy who's very interested in, in, in chatting about what we've been doing. And my son is actually sitting in the car here. And that is the, apart from the selfie at home, that's the only record I have of us. But I think it's a historic record nonetheless. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is Drone Henge. Thank you very much. <laughs>